Ya ves, tiene para dos o ¿eh? Pero ya le has dado. the CTO here at Rovit. Uh, it's a pleasure for, for us to have all of you here and uh, the guys of Music Brain too. I mean, we really like to, to host these sort of meetups. We normally do this in beta beers. I don't, I don't know if, if you know that. It's more, it's more uh, PHP meetup oriented. And we do it here by, I don't know, one time every two months, something like that. Um, any one of you have ever been here before or have known anything about Troid? All right, so I'm gonna give you like a brief introduction of three minutes and then I'm gonna leave you with the guys from Music Brains. Well, for those who don't know, that I've seen it's, uh, most of you, uh, Troid is a search engine for, for classified ads. We are uh, present in 42 countries uh, with office just here in Barcelona. I mean, the website is in 42 countries, but the website, uh, the office is here. And we are working in three business categories, which are uh, real estate, second-hand cars, and, and jobs. Right? We have like, uh, I don't know, now it's like 200 million documents. And, and we're a site with like pretty quite a lot of traffic. It's like uh, 170 million visits per month. And well, to be able to to handle this traffic and to serve like a small response time queries to the end user, we have a pretty uh, wide or diverse platform. We have uh, many different teams in, in the company, like some of them are Java backend, backend teams, which basically, what basically do is like uh, crunch data data using like no, no SQL technologies like uh, Hadoop, Redis, uh, Solar, HBase. I don't know, any of you is familiar with no SQL technologies or backend? Okay, so well, you will understand that part. Basically what we do is like we put all our data to the cluster and we crunch it, index the data to, to be able to, to be served by the website and do well all sort of uh, all kind of uh, analytic, uh, analytics uh, reports that you can imagine with all the impressions, all the clicks from the users, uh, everything related to data. Then we have a web development team that takes care basically of the front end. And we are putting now specially focus in, in the mobile applications. We have a growing team of uh, Android developers and iOS developers. And well, if you are interested in knowing a little bit more about the company of, or, or any of the small departments, uh, well, you can ask any of the Trovit guys which are here, that are Mikel and Victor, that are around. And well, anyone that is interested in, in working or understanding a little bit more of what's Trovit, uh, ask any one of us. We are constantly hiring, so it's good for us. And well, now, I'm going to leave you with the uh, Music Brains guys. <laughs> so I'm not a Music Brains guy, <laughs> but I'm presenting this meetup. I'm Martin Gonzalez from the Barcelona Free Software team. Uh, welcome to our meetup. I don't know if any of you is that your first meetup here in this group. Please raise your hand. Oh, that's good. Uh, we organize free software meetups about a bunch of diverse stuff. We had like KD things. We have. We are going to have a tour meetup, and we are constantly trying to find new topics about to talk. And we usually do our meetups in the evening. This is our first time here and try it, and it's a nice place. So we are going. Maybe we are going to do one meetup here and then another meetup in the evening. We are not sure. <coughs> so 
if you have any idea, you work in an open source project, just tell us, and we will arrange a nice meetup like this. And now uh, I'm going to present the uh, Xavier Serra and Robert K from um, the Music Brains project and University Pompeu Fabra, and they're awesome. So. Alright, so first of all, I apologize uh, for not uh, speaking Spanish yet. I um, should really be working on that instead of just keep hacking on open source projects. So, <laughs> Spanish will come. Um, I'm Robert Kay. I created Music Brains about 15 years ago. And um, how many of you guys have heard about Music Brains? Raise your hand. Okay, so quite a number of you. So, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but uh, the bottom line is that we're a uh, open music metadata database. So, we're working <laughs> on becoming a uh, music encyclopedia. Uh, we're open and not evil, um, which is important to say because the, the project only exists because um, I, back in my college days, I typed in a lot of CDs, all the metadata for the CDs, put it into CDDB, and then CDDB was taken private, and I didn't get any money for the work that I did, and I was kind of pissed off. And a friend of mine said, okay, stop bitching about this and just go make your own open source thing. I was like, ah, 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 I should do that. So I did, and 15 years later, here I am, and uh, my life is significantly different because of it. So it's been a lovely journey, <clears throat> and I've learned a lot along the way. And um, one of the things is also how to actually bring business into open source and how to keep the lights on, which is very difficult. That's one of the things that I like to talk about because uh, we have a nonprofit, the MetaBrains Foundation. Uh, it's headquartered in California. Uh, I run completely remotely, which is also nice. I don't have to be in California anymore. Um, and we have an annual income of only about a quarter million dollars, three hundred thousand dollars. That's not a lot of money, but uh, we can do an awful lot of things with those because we manage to actually have a team that get paid. But at the same time, we have volunteers uh, literally all over the world, and we even have, have a server in Antarctica. Not our server, but uh, it's managed by somebody else. So that's pretty cool. Um, so that's a quick, uh, quick rundown of uh, Music Brains, uh, sort of the beginning of it. Um, the reason why I want to talk about Music Brains just a little bit is because it's important to understand what Music Brains does before we can really start talking about Essentia and then Acoustic Brains, because without it, um, we would not have been able to do Acoustic Brains as quickly as we did. Uh, one of the features inside of uh, Music Brains, or part of Music Brains, is a tool called Picard. How many of you guys have used Picard and downloaded and tagged your music collection with it? All right, like three people. That's very good. Um, <clears throat> It's, uh, this used to be vastly more important back in the days when we had so many P2P systems and people were downloading music everywhere and the metadata and these tags was absolute crap. So then if you try to play all the stuff that you downloaded, there would be three tracks of this artist and this album and then three tracks of here and then 12 tracks over there and your playback experience really sucked. So we created this tool that allows you to go take your tracks and feed them into the card and it does either a music metadata analysis or an acoustic analysis with acoustic fingerprinting to figure out what your tracks are and then download the data from Music Brains, write clean metadata tags, and then write the files in a clean directory structure. The most important, so this is, this is a really, this is, this saves you a lot of effort, and people that are really experienced with this can tag, and I can really fly, I can tag 10,000 tracks in an hour if I'm moving, if the data is reasonably clean to start with. Um, the important thing about this is that Music Brains identifies artists, labels, works, um, releases, places, uh, events, and everything gets a unique ID, a UUID. You know, it's sort of impersonal to give an artist uh, a UUID, but it's really important because what we're trying to do is enable unambiguous communication about music, and there's a lot of ambiguous communication about music. So with these Music Brains IDs, we can now say, oh, well, we're talking about Pink Floyd, the Pink Floyd, breathe. Are we talking about the, the second half of the first track of the CD? Are we talking about the second track on the vinyl or the 1973 Wembley Live version of that? Um, with Music Brains IDs, you can clearly tell which one of these it is if it's uh, divided apart from the other ones. Um, and most important, this is that we take these Music Brains IDs and we write them into the files so that in, in the future, when somebody says, hey, what do I have? They can look at the idea and go back to Music Brains and they can fetch the most up to date data with it. And this is probably the most important reason that I wanted to get to with Music Brains. So we have, um, I have no idea how many files, but I'm guessing that there might be a million tracks to get tagged with Music Brains every day. So we've been doing this for, for a long time, so there's tons and tons of files out there that are scattered all over the globe, including Antarctica, that have Music Brains IDs in them. So with that, um, that is sort of the basis and the, the, the key introduction. 
Um, now we're actually going to switch gears, which is the other piece of introduction, which is the Essential Toolkit, which was developed here in Barcelona at the uh, University of Pompeo Fabra. And for that, we will have uh, Xavier and Sarah give us a quick introduction to Essential. Okay, so let me uh, have some slides. Uh, um, Okay. So, to introduce the Sentia, I guess, uh, let, let me just quickly uh, tell uh, where I come from. Um, I, I come from the Music Technology Group of the Pompeo Power University. That's a research group dedicated to music. Uh, we are around... So, the... <coughs> The MPG is a research group within the, the engineering department, and uh, we have like around 50 researchers. So it's a pretty large, I, mean, I guess one of the largest uh, research groups dedicated to this uh, uh, in the world. And um, we have been working basically on audio, so on analyzing audio, and on uh, trying to uh, make generate meaningful information from this audio so that it can be used for, uh, for some. So, here is that. so uh, well, we have different, um, different research areas that we work on. And to just give you an idea, let me give you some projects that we have done in the past and some of the current ones so that you get an idea of what to do. And hopefully, you will know about some of them. Uh, so for example, who knows about the React table? OK. So the right table was a project we started like uh, seven, eight years ago. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, uh, Vocaloid, uh, who, uh, who knows Vocaloid and Hatsune Miku and uh, all this? Uh, okay, so that's uh, another project we have done in collaboration with uh, Yamaha. And uh, he has it al alive on his own in uh, Japan, quite uh, active. And uh, another one is uh, Free Sound that we started around 10 years ago. and. Um, it relates very much with what we're talking about. I mean, one of the biggest bottlenecks that uh, both musicians and researchers working in music have is access <coughs> to the actual audio. Uh, the audio, because of all the copyright issues, uh, becomes very difficult to have access in large quantities and especially to share it and to, to uh, play around with that. So we started Free Sound because we didn't dare to work with music to collect uh, audio to collect uh, sounds. And by now, it's a, it's a pretty uh, healthy and active community of people contributing to that. Uh, there's uh, so like close to 4 million <coughs> registered users. Uh, there is 250,000 uh, sounds. And uh, they're very, very used for a lot of things. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that either, just briefly, because this is uh, underneath that is Essentia, which is the library that I talk about. And more recent projects, all supported by Essentia, which is what I'm going to talk about, are these ones. Uh, let me maybe first uh, talk about these. This is a Dunia, which is a result of a research project we currently have that focuses on kind of non-Western music traditions to try to push the current technologies and show that most current technologies are very uh, Western-centric and that when we put them in uh, contexts that are very different to ours, everything breaks. And, uh, and it, well, uh, there is a long story there because it's a very interesting thing when you try to do these type of things. So anyway, so this is a project that tries using music brains and using Essentia to push that and basically also collaborating with music brains to see how we can push these technologies that mainly were originally developed for a kind of Western pop music type of things into uh, non-Western specific situations. Another project uh, that we just released at the NAM show uh, uh, two or three weeks ago uh, is these Good Sounds and Cortosia, which is a, it's an app uh, that uh, is, uh, is able to tell you how well you play a given sound. And this goes together with a, a collection of sound, which are also in free sound, that are analyzed with the Sentia, and that uh, can characterize how good a sound is. But anyway, I'm not going to. So these are some of the current processes. So you get an idea of what we do. Um, some are open, more open, some are not. But this is completely open. 
uh, this is hot open in the sense that uh, this is one of the things that we like to explore, how to make, uh, again, as, 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 as Rob uh, said, kind of open source, uh, but also make it sustainable and make it within a commercial uh, type of context. So for example, with Corp, the, the, we, we license uh, the open source Essentia library uh, as a dual license so that they can use it in a, in a, in a, in a closed context. And at the same time, it's supported by a Creative Commons type of framework in which users collaborate and participate uh, to contribute the sounds and uh, comments and thoughts and etc. But the one we want to talk about is uh, Acoustic Brains. And uh, before doing that, uh, which I guess, uh, again, we could do it more, uh, uh, well, I guess uh, Rob will, uh, will have a, a presentation, but then we can have a discussion. Um, the idea is that in order to uh, have access to music, um, and, and that's uh, something that, uh, as I said, is difficult. We can have access to, to open sounds, but open music is much harder. So the idea was, okay, what we are interested in, for a lot of research issues we need, we, it's okay, instead of having the audio, to have the analysis of the audio. Okay? So with Essentia, which is uh, uh, the, the, the library that we have been developing for a long time at the NTG, uh, that uh, we first, uh, it was a closed library that uh, we, we created, we licensed to a spin-off company that we had, and then after when the, the exclusive license ran out, we were able to make it open, and, uh, and now it's uh, under uh, Fero GPL. Uh, but that means that it has gone through quite a kind of an industrial robustness type of situation, so it's, uh, it's pretty stable. It's, it's far from what we would like it to be, and we're gonna talk about that but it's a good starting ground to do a lot of things. Um, so Essenti is basically a library of algorithms to analyze audio, that's where we started. You know? So the, the idea is that uh, we, uh, if we want to build uh, uh, some recommendation system, and that's what the starting point of Essenti was basically that this, uh, well, uh, Essent, uh, this uh, company, DMAT, uh, was uh, started with this idea to build uh, music recommendation systems and therefore uh, uh, based on audio content. You know? So when you talk about music recommendation, you always, uh, there is these uh, different ways that you can think of it. You can only use, you do it from a, from a sort of a, the, the, the information around it and user behavior and context information, or you can do it uh, uh, with uh, audio content, or you can do it both. So our approach was basically using the content so uh, that you can analyze and describe this music according to quite a number of things. I mean, it's a huge library. Uh, there is a lot of things that are kind of what we call low level and more uh, things to handle uh, audio and, uh, for example, even just the audio I.O. And, uh, and, and handling collections that have very different formats and standardize and be able to, to handle large collections in a unified way. We have to deal a lot with uh, different issues of uh, at, uh, low level uh, description and uh, I.O. And then there is higher level um, uh, kind of descriptors, which is basically what people like. You know? So basically uh, developers and companies, and uh, this is where the holy grail of, the, of these uh, things are. The problem is not solved, uh, but there are many companies that behave as if it had been solved. So you find all these different apps or all these different uh, companies uh, selling uh, recommendation systems, playlist generation systems, or I don't know, any kind of type of things that somehow rely on some technology like these that sincerely most of the time doesn't work so well. Ours neither, but uh, <laughs> we know about it and we are trying to do steps to uh, um, and the, the, the core concept of Essentia is that for a developer, you don't need to, to, to know the sort of the insights of every algorithm, and uh, you build what it's called extractors. Uh, so it's, it's done in a way that you can really put together uh, extractors uh, by combining this, uh, some of these uh, algorithms in different ways, and there is uh, like a streaming way so that you can do it like a real time and uh, without uh, uh, having to worry so much about memory or there is a standard way. So for example, a typical extractor would be identify the key, the core of a piece of music. 
or a, a fragment of a piece of music. So then they need to do uh, some similarity measure between one piece of music C is the same sequence of chords and another one. So this would be an example of a key extractor algorithm um, that combines several of these uh, low-level algorithms. So everything is written in C++, and then it has all these uh, Python uh, wrappers that uh, makes it also quite uh, easy to, to develop uh, these uh, extractors uh, in different ways. And uh, as I said, the typical applications that you can think of uh, that this type of uh, library is uh, used for is uh, the idea of classifying music. So classifying, for example, genres or classifying different concepts that you define or uh, adding tags. So if you have uh, some music that is tag and then uh, you want to find similar music and then propagate that tag. So for auto tagging, that's something that is uh, used. Um, for similarity, if you want to look for uh, songs that uh, are similar in some dimension of uh, this uh, musical multi-dimensional multi space, and then for uh, after that, you can recommend uh, songs that might be similar in one of these dimensions. And uh, the idea of visualizing, you know, how to, what well, this is again one of the biggest problems in, in music collections, how do you visualize large collections of music in a meaningful way so that you can, uh, you can navigate and the idea is with some of these uh, descriptors, you can do that. And then out of that, well, you can uh, index uh, that, that, that sound, for example, or you can detect uh, special things within, within a recording and identify instruments, etc. Uh, as I said, it, uh, everything is uh, C++ is a fair well. It has some dependencies uh, from libraries that we use. Uh, they are all um, open except the FFTW. So if you do, uh, for some uh, applications, then you would need uh, to license this everything down to algorithm, uh, which is uh, very much using a lot of things. But uh, we use uh, standard uh, libraries uh, for uh, different things that are more at the low level. Uh, and uh, the typical thing that people want, and that's uh, what uh, People normally don't care so much about low-level descriptors. They, they care about these high-level descriptors. And these are the ones that are not uh, kind of uh, 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 objectively obtained. You know, the, the idea is that you would like to identify the genre, if it's jazz or if it's uh, uh, whatever, uh, or, or different types of music uh, it's, uh, it is. That's not an objective uh, type of identification. Uh, for example, we can uh, classify according to different things like the mood or uh, some uh, whether something is uh, uh, the speed of a, of a piece of music or uh, to be able to uh, say if it's happy or sad. This is where the, 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 the current state of the art is at its limit, let's say. And this is one of the main reasons for acoustic brains. So one of the main reasons for us of acoustic brains is to improve this. In order to improve this, we need large collections of music that is well labeled and that we can develop data sets from which we can train. And that's not available openly. So uh, for researchers, for developers that want to develop these type of tools, it's impossible because, or it's very hard unless you are one of these big corporations where are in, uh, in, uh, in Apple or you are in Spotify or you are in that uh, has access to these uh, large collections. But from now on, there is another solution, which is acoustic brains. And I guess Rob will talk about that. So this plays, uh, oops, not well. this plays in really well to what I was saying earlier, why we need to go understand music brains. These files that we're talking about in our massive library are literally scattered all over the world. And uh, we started this project by uh, um, effectively having a um, a collection of, of of our friends, of our core friends, actually contribute and run this uh, Essentia-based uh, collection algorithm on um, on their music collections, and that allowed us to actually bootstrap within a um, very short period of time a pile of, uh, of files. Um, I think how long did it take us to get two quarter million files? Um, well, how much? A week. A week. A week. I thought it was a little more than that. I mean, in a really short period of time, we got to a quarter million uh, tracks, and they were just rolling in really quickly. So that was uh, that was really quite lovely. 
Um, so, that comes to um, I'm, I'm uh, essentially recycling a, a slide deck here, so there's a few things that are not terribly relevant for this particular conversation or things that uh, Xavier has already covered, so I may skip uh, through some of those and let us get to some discussion of some other aspects of this. But uh, here you can see that uh, acoustic brains and music brains are working together, and <coughs> we have these files that are literally scattered all over the world, as I already mentioned, and uh, they contain the music brains IDs, and then when somebody downloads the uh, acoustic brains extractor, what will happen then is that it will look at the file and say, hey, does it have a music brains ID? No? Okay, I'm not going to look at it. Um, if it has a music brains ID, then it will do the analysis, which is actually a fairly lengthy analysis. It takes maybe what, 10 seconds or so to do an analysis per tracks. It's very, it's pretty heavy in the grand scheme of things. But it does all these uh, analysis points, uh, analysis points that uh, Xavier pointed out, and then they get sent to the server, and um, we send them to the server, and the server keeps no private information whatsoever. Um, we, for a few days, keep track of your IP address as a uh, ways of figuring out if somebody is uh, spamming our system or, or uh, submitting bad data, and that's about it. So there's, we have no way, for better or for worse, to track back where one of these files came from. So if somebody came to us and said, you know, put a gun under our head and said, where did this file come to? We have no idea. We honestly cannot tell you where it came from. But uh, so instead of having access to 1.8 million files, we just have access to our friends who have 1.8 million files, which is almost as good. So we already spoke a little bit about the low-level data, and um, you know, we'll talk about these, uh, these various bits of data, and uh, my favorite line is the last one, it's just it's DSP voodoo. So if you don't know a lot about uh, DSP and a lot of music analysis and so forth, it's just a black box. There's a lot of hand-waving going on. I don't understand half these bits and pieces, so uh, not, terribly, uh, not terribly interesting to get into that kind of level of uh, discussion today. What is more interesting is the high-level data. Um, and the high-level data is actually, the, there's, no, there's no DSP voodoo that goes into it, it's machine learning voodoo. So it's a completely different bag of voodoo that we're dealing with. Uh, and in particular, so what, uh, the way this happens, and how many of you are familiar with machine learning, basic machine learning stuff? Okay, not a lot. So the basic uh, idea behind uh, machine learning is that uh, you start off with a data set. And um, you could say like, okay, here's 10,000 tracks that I believe are classic, these are like the definitive rock tracks, right? And then you can actually train a machine with this data set and say, okay, learn what these 10,000 tracks look like, what they sound like, and these are rock tracks. And then in the future, once you have a model that gets generated from this uh, training session, then you can actually take a track, an unknown track that you don't know what it is, and you can throw it at the model, at this classifier, and then you can say, what is it? And it will say, well, you told me to classify rock, or maybe you can do multiple different um, genres, or what, however you build the model, um, and it'll tell you, well, I think it's rock, or more likely it's going to tell you it's 70% rock, and maybe 30% this, or you know, 20 this, 50 that, 20 that, 10 that. Um, it all depends on how you actually do this. Now, um, some of the data, um, data sets that we have access to that are being used to train the models that are part of the essentially high-level classification scheme talk about tonal, timbre, uh, vocals, uh, genre, I mean gender, moods, and all of these things. Now, one of the things that we didn't know is that, does this stuff actually work? Does, do these training sets actually work? And when you look at the, the actual papers that are being presented, they look really good, right? But yeah, the training set was a thousand tracks. It was contrived here, it was contrived there, and they're trying to make it another improvement of like 5% or 10% of the previous research. But it doesn't really mean that it actually works in the real world. So, as Javier mentioned, the, the motivation here is for us to actually build things that actually stand up to the real world. And the idea behind it then is that we're going to build a training set that actually you know, throws 10,000, 50,000 tracks at it. Because we have this data, but it's not very hard for us to get it because things in music brains are tagged with genres and, uh, I mean, in the form of tags. And other people can say, hey, um, you guys suck at doing it. So what we're actually doing, and we have a guy in Russia who's hacking all this stuff for us, is to actually crowdsource the creation of these data sets. So if any of you guys want to do, say like, hey, I want to create my own genre classifier, hopefully within a few weeks we'll actually have a system up and running where you can say, these tracks here, I believe to be of this particular genre, and then you can train it, 
and then you can throw tracks at it and have it do a classification for you. And then you can see, well, no, that didn't work out so well, or that worked. This is great, this is not great. So to give you an idea as to where I'm coming from with this is that I have sort of a, a particular flavor of music I, I really like. I mean, I like lots of pieces of music, but uh, in particular, it's like Swedish down tempo with soldier female vocals, right? Like Spotify can't give me that, right? So I want to build a set of classifiers that say, is this down tempo or not? Is this female or not? Is this sultry or not, right? And so I'm going to take my own personal itch, as it were, and start building some classifiers for this and see how, if, if I can, with this real world data, do a little bit better than the researchers could. Or I will sit here and go like, oh, wow, you know, this is really hard. So but we don't know where we're going to end up yet, right? This, this, is the, this is the real world, and we know that so far the data that we've collected, and I'll show you an example in a minute, is questionable, right? But, and, you know, we never stated from the outset that this data that we have is perfect. It's not. No, we're not going to say that. We're saying that, yeah, this data's got some problems. Let's go collect some. Let's figure out how can we actually make this data better. And by that, we're creating a feedback loop. So this feedback loop is that uh, the geeks will actually use and contribute the um, acoustic brain's data. And they've realized that, well, you know, some of these things are not working so well as they're hacking with this. And then they give code and issues and various other bits of feedback back to us that allow us to improve the data. We'll make the data better, people will download it, and again, uh, the cycle continues. Um, I'm, I'm a really big fan of building these types of feedback loops because they're, they're so virtuous, especially if you don't have to charge anybody. You know, what America really loves to do is like charge somebody here, charge somebody there. <laughs> I, I just want to see things happen. I want to see these data loops and I want to see the data improve. And that's what we've done with music rights, where the tagger allowed people to bring, to tag their music collection. And then we ask people to help fix the data inside of music brains so that people kind of were brought into music brains. They might walk away for a while, but then their data collection would get dirty again and then would come back. And then it created this feedback loop. And that's how music brains was created. So we're in the infancy of this kind of feedback loop inside of acoustic brains. But these are really powerful mechanisms, and uh, one of the very few ways you can do, do that is, well, one of the ways you can do that that is really powerful is to use open source. So our goal at the end of all of this, um, also treading some of the uh, ground that uh, Xavier covered, first of all, we're probably going to do some disrupting with this because there are existing companies, so if anybody knows about the Echo Nest, now part of Spotify, uh, they have a pile of data that's really interesting stuff that they're sitting on. And you can play with it. You can there's, you know, use your API and so forth, but you can only do so many things through their API. If you really want access to all of the data, they're gonna pull a lot of money out of your pocket. And we hate that. We want to play with all of the data. So what we're doing is we're basically building all of this data, putting it out there so that we don't want to play with this. And uh, hopefully soon we'll have exactly that. So the idea then is that we can focus on algorithms. So the, the things that everyone in this room is really comfortable and uh, happy to do is to hack on some more code, rather than spending our time collecting this music. Right? Any of these research organizations, these companies, the first thing that they need to do is grab a bunch of people and say, like, OK, let's go collect a few million tracks. Right? And then six months later, if you didn't get sued in the process, you've got a million tracks or two million tracks to work with, and I can actually get to work. Right? So we're trying to actually make this so that anybody here in this room that wants to work on this can just download a couple of things or click on the website or maybe write some Python scripts that will do the automatic building of data sets and start doing these things so much faster than you could before because we've done all this work for you guys. So um, now we're going really, this is like, off into the future. Um, right now, there are music recommendation engines and so forth. They have lots of bells and whistles, things you can tweak that actually end up being pretty complicated, both for users and for the people that are programming them and so forth. And at the end, a lot of these things don't get exposed to the users. So I want to tweak with these things. I want to say, like, okay, yes, I listen to French hip hop, Spotify, but really, yeah, that's enough now. I, you know, you just keep throwing French hip hop at me. I, I, that one track was really cool, but can you please stop? Right? I want to be able to say, like, you know, no more French hip hop for the next three weeks. Well, Spotify doesn't let me do that. But these are the kinds of tools that I want to want to see. So maybe I can actually build a recommendation engine where I can say, like, no more French hip hop for the next three weeks, and my system understands this, and then it'll just go to Spotify and play for me. So Spotify just becomes this 
you know, the, the service that does things for me, but the discovery is actually on my terms and not so much on Spotify's terms, which I think is really quite exciting. So part of this then, then hopefully we can build more compelling user interfaces to actually take some of these advanced features that are hidden in all of these systems and expose them, and then in the end give the users a little bit more control. Now, part of that is that I'm really going to be relying on you guys, or you know, the, the greater you guys, so the royal you guys, um, about to, to hack on this stuff and to help out, figure out like, well, no, hell's there, your data sucks over here, this sucks, but hey, look at this thing that I built. Um, and um, actually, while I'm here, I'm going to jump in and say that, because we have, we have a student at the university who built this particular project. Neat little project. And um, it's called Twitter Brains. And what it's doing is it is listening to the Twitter stream, all of it, and it finds uh, when somebody's playing a music track, then looks it up inside of Music Brains, and then looks it up inside of Acoustic Brains to get the acoustic qualities. And it plots the, um, uh, the, the feeling of the song, uh, left is negative, right is positive, and then the, the amount of energy, more energy up here, lower energy down here, and can you see something emerging? <laughs> What's this? Yeah, we don't know. We don't have an answer yet. Right? But everybody looks at this like, what is this line at point two? What is wrong with your data? Like, yeah, well, hey. What do you mean yet. by it's positive? <laughs> the well, comments left on Twitter? or the No, so when well, somebody says, I'm playing this track, right? And they, they, they have some sort of service or some player that says, I'm playing this track. It takes that track information identifies it inside of music brains. If it can identify it, then it asks acoustic brains uh, for the acoustic qualities of that. And then it plots a dot on this graph based with those qualities. So this is happening completely in real time. So the music brain servers and the acoustic brain servers are being hit every time you look at this page. Uh, so that's really cool. That's kind of neat and interesting. Um, and it's just a fantastic visualization that shows us that um, yeah, our audience have a problem around point two. We don't, we don't know what this is just yet. but. You know, we, we said that there is some, some questionable data out there, and we meant it, right? So maybe one of you guys will look at this and say, like, you guys are idiots. We'll figure out what that problem is. Please. We'd love to. So um, uh, let's see. And the difference in the color, what was it? Major and minor. Um, yeah, major and minor key. OK. So let me jump back into finishing off our presentation here. Um, so this is, this is a, again, a slide that was slightly targeted for, uh, for the music industry people in particular. Um, one of the things that I particularly have uh, an issue with is that the existing music industry is very well designed to keep all the people that are in the music industry in the music industry. And they like the people, the artists, the managers that they like, they want them to get more money. It has nothing to do with who should fairly earn money or whether the music is any good. It's a very much an old boy network, like, I like you, I don't like you, you get more money, right? And then there's some, some honest problems out there that the music brand is trying to solve. Like, for instance, there's like six or so people named John Williams, and you know, two famous composers, and then a couple of people, like an acoustic guitarist in, in, in Australia. That Australian guy never gets any money, because when, when somebody's trying to figure out who to give his money to, it's like, ah, oh, just do it, give it to the guy that did the Star Wars soundtrack. Right? So that guy gets too much money, and the guy in Australia doesn't get any money. So there's a lot of problems in the music industry. Right? Um, and one of the things that I'm hoping that well, it's not going to happen tomorrow, well, it's going to maybe happen in five years' time, we can see some changes with this, where I think we can actually disrupt, first of all, the wild gardens. So this is talking about this kind of acoustic information that is not available. We're making it available so that more people can come play. And um, a lot of discovery systems have this, this bias built in. So you guys all familiar with the long tail, right? Okay. I see some. So the long tail basically means that uh, there's a lot of content that doesn't get listened to. So as the curve drops off, there's a lot of content, a lot of really good stuff out there also that never ever gets played. And one of the things that Spotify does is that recommends what I love this term is the fat head, not the long tail, but it recommends into the fat head that always recommends towards the things that you know that people like. It's the, it's the popular stuff. Well, I like to change this, this discovery and recommendation bias to actually point more to the good stuff, right? And that means pointing towards the long tail. Um, that's a lot of hand waving and so forth, but um, you know. 
how that exactly plays itself out, we won't really know. But um, all I know is that there's a lot of recommendation bias that I don't like. Because uh, you know this recommendation bias, if you keep pointing to the popular artists, that means the popular artists get more plays. And that means that you can't ever dislodge the popular artists. And the small artists have no chance of ever breaking in and making money with it. So they're kind of stuck playing small gigs for beer money. And they're never, never actually going to support themselves, which is really frustrating. So part of this then is uh, we want to create more interoperable tools. These brings, again, these brings IDs. Crowdsource discovery is one of those things where I just mentioned that we're going to be building a tool where you can make your own training sets and then evaluate your own training sets. So that's crowdsourced data set training. And then we also want to take that one level further and do crowdsourced evaluation and multiple layers of this. So crowdsourcing the crowdsourcing. Um, lots of hand waving, but there's lots of interesting cool things that can come out of this over time. But again, with anything with open source, you're not going to do anything in 20 minutes. It's going to take a few years for all of this to completely evolve. Uh, in the end, what I'm really hoping that it will happen is that uh, the little artists will get uh, a better um, exposure on all mediums, uh, in Spotify, and radio, and TV, and what you hear when you go to the shops, and what have you. And ultimately, what I'd really like to see is the little guys, the little bands, um, actually make a living out of this, because there's not a lot of people that can do that right now, and I find that to be very frustrating. So, um, end of my presentation, um, uh, if you guys could help out, um, the number one thing is tagging your music collection with the card. How many of you guys actually still have MP3s or audio files sitting on a hard drive? All right, about uh, 50%, so that's interesting. So that's, that's, that's changing, um, but uh, I, I, got, I have to admit, I spend a lot of time on Spotify myself, so I, my music collection isn't up to date as, as well either. But uh, tag your collection with, me, with the card if you'd like to help out, and then run the music, uh, the Crystal Brains uh, client on your collection, and that helps us actually feed data into the system, and uh, from there you're contributing and helping us out. Um, if you'd like to, we'd love to have people um, help us actually work on these things. Love pull requests. Uh, we're both working on the server side of things, the client side of things, working on Essentia. We're doing quite a, few, quite a few interesting things with this, and we're always looking for more people to help out. Anything to add, Joe, here? Any questions, comments, discussion? How do you deal with people uploading malicious data on acoustic frames? I mean, I can imagine some trolls would be like, yeah, let's just go with their data, and just people who are bored in life, I can totally imagine that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then this, is, this is definitely a problem that we haven't found yet, but we're also not entirely certain that it has or not has happened. We'll so see. 0.2 might be someone. So actually what you're looking at there was, <laughs> what, you're, what you're looking at there was the high level data that's derived from the low level data. So that's not, that wouldn't be that type of artifact. But you're, 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 you're spot on to something, this is something that we worry about. Alistair and I have uh, had a lot of discussions over this. And one of the very first things that we're working to do is to actually build a, um, uh, for these, these data elements, we actually call them tacos, we don't get started on that one. But for, it's a JSON document that describes all of this information. And uh, so it's, it's, what, 60K in data? Um, or is it more, it's 200k for the low level, 60k for high level? Okay, 60k for the low level. So it's a 60k JSON document with lots of numbers. That's in. per file? Per file, yeah. right? So, and this is actually, this is just doing a snapshot, the entire analysis over the entire file. Um, if we really wanted to get lower grain, we would do an analysis every 10 seconds. So then we would be collecting that data every 10 seconds. So already we're at like 35 gigabytes compressed data download. So we're only going to make those problems much worse, but um, yeah. So but what we're doing, the, one of the things that we're um, desperately trying to get to is do a comparison function. For these two data files, are they the same? Because um, if they run through uh, an, an audio codec, so uh, compressed with MP3, then decompressed and analyzed, compared to a FLAC file that is an exact one, the, the data is going to change. It's going to be different. So how do you compare these, these data bits? It's not a, that's not an easy thing to do. And then what we're going to do is once we actually have this function to compare things, we will just compare all the duplicates <laughs> in our database. And then we can see this one looks really dodgy compared to all the other files that we have. And then we can start flagging them for, we think this is not a good file, this is kind of troublesome. And um, ideally, when you have duplicates in the database, then all they should basically be the same data. 
we're not, we're, we're still all identifying problems in our own code, so that's not quite there yet. Um, but that's, that's, that's the basic idea behind it, that we can identify bad data as, as it comes in. And then we have, uh, we'll keep track of the IP addresses for a few days, then we discard the logs. So then hopefully we can say, all right, we're gonna go um, throw out the things were submitted by this particular client. So that's on our radar, but as far as I know, that hasn't happened yet. So, so. no code relating to this right now? Pardon? So no code relating to this right now? Uh, not yet, but you know, okay. please don't let this be <laughs> any encouragement for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a acoustic rate um, program, the engine. Does it also not only send the essential description, but also the acoustic ID? Uh, so we don't actually calculate an acoustic ID per se. Um, what we do is the analysis on the, uh, that Accenture carries out is actually far more detailed than calculating uh, an acoustic identifier. So in theory, we should be able to actually calculate an acoustic ID from the data that is being sent to the server. Uh, what we do send to the server is the low-level analysis and the SHAs of binaries that are being used to calculate this and uh, um, the, the tags in your metadata files uh, as well. So, um, but we're not. We're, we're sanitizing them. Because we had this one unfortunate situation where it's like, we'll just take all the tags that are in the files. And then somebody you know, pulls us aside and says, uh, did you know that there's lyrics in your database? Oh, shit, 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 delete, delete, delete. So we, uh, we I mean, because that's obviously a copyright issue, right? So we can't have lyrics. So what we do is we have a white list of tags that we can accept that, so that are okay, and then we throw away all the other tags that are not fitting. But that's all we send to the server. Uh, that's thought that uh, maybe this problem of duplicates you can solve with uh, acoustic ID. Um, yeah, well, so it's not really a problem with duplicates. Um, we're actually very interested in keeping and having the duplicates for now because the du duplicates can tell us a lot of information about what is what happens when something is being compressed by an MP3, by this MP3 encoder, by that MP3 encoder. What happens when it's being encoded by WMA? By, so we there's actual. Uh, research value in analyzing what happens to the values as they get changed when they go through different codecs. So for now, there's value in this, and I suspect at some point we'll realize what that value is, and then say like, oh, we don't really care about this anymore. We'll make just throw away a bunch of duplicates. But for now, duplicates have value for us. Any other questions? You said you got lots of money as an organization. Where does that come? I wouldn't say we have lots of money. <laughs> um, a $300,000 annual budget uh, only pays for about three full-time employees. So it doesn't, and, you know, we have to pay for servers and all these other things. Um, what Music Brands, the, that's the main money driver at this point, it does is we license the data for commercial use. So Amazon, BBC, Spotify, Last.fm, uh, a pile of other companies use our data. So if you actually go to Google search and you type U2, and then on the sidebar you get the U2 information, not the cover art, but uh, the, the, the um, factual information that comes from these reports. And uh, they pay us extra, they don't have to tell the world where the data comes from. That's actually part of their secret sauce, they'll never tell you where the data comes from that is actually inside of Google search. So they're paying us twice market rate for, for that privilege, and then Google pays us in other different ways, and we're a really good relationship with Google. But the bottom line is that we're still really only making, you know, not a lot of money, but um, you know, hoping to change that by um, and actually working on a new uh, website as we speak. And this website basically will say like, here are the universities and open source projects that are using your stuff. You guys are cool. Here is the, all the people that are paying us for using this data. You guys are cool. And here's this huge column of all the people that are not paying us anything, right? These people are very likely using our data completely legally. They're, they're abiding by the licenses, uh, and most of the useful data is uh, in the public domain, right? But still, there's all these companies that decline to actually give us anything back. So, and we've never really asked. Um, one, of the, one of the ways I describe how the MetaBrights Foundation does business is actually by using the drug dealer business model. And that is, oh, the first one's free. Come, go ahead, use your data, right? And I think at some point, I'll come back around and say, like, okay, guys, give us money. Right? I kind of thought that that point should have come about 10 years ago, so. but it's, it's been a long road to get there, but we're now here. And the, the beautiful part of this is that the analogy of the drug dealer business model actually holds true, because if you have a database that has got a million records that point to music brands and have these IDs and you need to go to some other provider, 
Well, it turns out other providers will be happy to take $10,000 of your money per month, right? You know, our standard list for fee for having an updated service that updates every hour is only $1,500 a month. So you can choose to go pay these guys way more money and go through the effort to change your million records to point to this other service that is not as good as ours. So when we actually say, these are the people that are not giving us money, I'm going to ring them up and say, hey, I'm going to put you guys on this website over here. Do you guys want to give us some money so you can go into this column of the cool people? Thanks for giving us money. So we'll see how that goes. Um, did you guys hear about the story that I sent Amazon a cake? This is my favorite, one of my favorite stories. This is one of those, like, I, I didn't see this one coming, but it worked really well. So Amazon, one of our customers, they're good guys. They really wanted to pay us. But this department had a problem, that department had a problem, and this other department had a problem. They just couldn't figure out how to pay us. There's this one invoice that was almost three years old, and they couldn't figure out how to pay us. So I said, look, guys, if in two weeks you guys don't have to solve problem, this problem solved, I'm going to go send you guys a cake. What do you mean? All right, well, I'm going to go send an anniversary cake of the third anniversary of invoice number 144. Right? And I'm going to post a picture on Twitter. Oh, no, 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 don't do that. Oh, no, no, no. Like, we'll get this fixed, right? And then all the emails every other day, like, we'll have this fixed, we'll have this fixed, we'll have this fixed. And then hours before the deadline, I'm like, hey, I ordered the cake. My friend is going to pick it up and drive it to you guys tomorrow. No, 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 we'll figure this out. No solution. It just wasn't happening, right? So my friend drove over there, delivered the cake, sent it to Amazon. Right, and then just walked away and sent me the picture. I put it on, on Twitter, and uh, Corey, Corey Doctorow, one of our board members, put it up on Boing Boing. And from there, it just took off. Like a bunch of news people covered it and so forth. And then I started getting panic phone calls from Amazon. Like, ah, <laughs> we're we're going to go on to an you know, emergency meeting, da 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 da. So the cake arrived on Tuesday morning, and a $22,500 check. Every single money, they're saying every single dollar that they owed us, including things that weren't really due yet. They just you know, they called me up and said, like, we think we owe you this. I'm like, yes, that's exactly what you guys owe. Great. We'll have a check for you in California at 9.30 in the morning. That costs a lot of money to have a check in California at 9.30 in the morning. But like, it'll be there first thing. And the people that receive mail from me in California just, just you know, sent me a message like, this must be really weird. There's, like, there's a big check for you. And it showed up really early. <laughs> Amazon really wanted this problem to go away. So this problem went away. And um, I'm not supposed to know this. Don't blog. <laughs> but I got a bunch of friends that work for Amazon, and they all kind of pulled me aside and said, like, here, this is the internal team that does these incident reports. When we get bad press, this is a complete write-up of what happened. And they said, you did really good work. The only negative feedback they had for you was that you hit them too hard. You hit them on Twitter, you hit them on Yahoo News, you hit them on da 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 They thought that was a little excessive. <laughs> that was the only critique they had for us. And then they said, like, this department had a problem, that department had a problem, that department had a problem. And they put together a task force to fix those problems. And they said, we identified at least seven other organizations that fall, fell in the same cracks and we owe them money. So because of this, these guys are also going to get paid. Yes! So that was my Amazon cake story. So that's, that's, where, that's where the money comes from. It's not glorious, but it allows me to um, keep doing my job. And we have a couple of people uh, that are working for us in Chicago, in Arizona, and uh, a couple of volunteers that are being paid marginally something in this community. So we're paying an open source. It's really not that bad. So pretty happy. Do you know how uh, Wikidata is also collecting time to make all the Wikipedia data more machine searchable? And they do have artist information. I can yes. imagine there's a big overlap and a big com because they are backed up and they're 100% overlap. Yes, it's 100% overlap. <laughs> Same people, right? Yeah. <laughs> because the data comes from us. OK. Yeah. But then they have commercial backers as well, and they might can make commercial deals, or can they not? Or? Um, I don't know exactly how that works. Our data is, is, is public domain CC0, so we don't particularly care about that, right? If some company comes in and they use our data and they're using it via Wikidata, I'm still going to put them in this column, people are using our data, <laughs> right? So I, I don't particularly care. Um, so Wikidata was just given the Freebase data from Google, which was uh, you know, sort of a competing closed project that Google has given up, and so the Wikidata is getting bad. But uh, Wikidata and Music Brains are friends, and they basically said, look, you guys are the domain experts for music. We're working together. And Lydia, the head of, uh, head of um, Wikidata, she continues to just you know, say, like, look, 
love music brains, and any time that somebody wants to work on a project for syncing up two databases, she goes, go to music brains. That's the first place you should start because their data rules. So uh, we have a good working, working relationship with them, and we like to keep it that way. So somebody in Wikidata just deleted a piece of data and said that, oh yeah, just because it's a music brains is not noteworthy or not notable enough. <laughs> Deletions. All right, one last question if you have it. Did you get any feedback from the music industry about the project yet? No, and I really like that, right? For, by and large, the music industry doesn't understand what we're doing, right? Uh, for two reasons. One, it's complicated. And two, we are all these crazy people from the internet, and they look at me and look, did you see that guy's hair and he can't match his socks, right? They just, they just don't know what to do with us. So that's actually really good. Because one of the things um, I, I alluded to a minute ago, that this analysis happens over the entire track, right? If you were to make that analysis to, say, like, you do an analysis every five seconds, you're starting to get to really low-level data where somebody could argue that you could reconstruct portions of the music from the data that were collected, which is completely bogus. I mean, yes, you'd never want to listen to it, right? But somebody could start, start constructing these bogus arguments that, we, that, that would endanger us. So, my attitude towards this is like, fabulous. Let the music industry come snoop around and look at us and so forth and say like, oh, those open source hackers, we don't have to worry about them. And then they go about their business, ignore us. That's perfect. Because then if we want to go back in and say like, okay, let's, let's actually slice these tracks and say, let's, let's collect more of this information because you know somebody gave us a bunch of disk space and so forth. We can just quietly toil in, in our business and go about the things we want to do with nobody snooping around. And then with Music Brains, um, it happened that like 10 years after our, our existence, the music industry looked up and said, wow, this is really useful. All the major labels have admitted to me that, that Music Brains is one of their primary forms of looking up their own data. <laughs> okay. So this is, this is on, on par for the same thing. Uh, we will get there where we will become a really valuable resource to the music industry. And they won't really think about selling us because we're an important part of the music industry now. So, anyways, um, I don't want to monopolize your time any further. Uh, I do believe there's now some beers, and if you have any more questions, uh, Xavier, Alistair, and myself will be here to answer any of your further questions. And uh, thank you for your time.